Greeting members and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you would like to learn how to become a member of the channel or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, those links can be found down below. If you are new here or have been here and not done so yet, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does it help push this video into the algorithm, but it also reminds you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes, for once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Home Invasion Stories. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. First things first, this is not my story, but it's my father's. This happened in the summer of 1993. My dad and his girlfriend, now my stepmother, we were living in Cardiff, Wales that is, in the city center. Not a particularly high crime area, a lot of student accommodation. I won't give the exact location, but there was a cafe nearby named the Warmest Toast Cafe. Amusingly abbreviated on the front as Twat Cafe. <laughs> I'm sorry, you all. <laughs> Can you imagine waking up to go get coffee and you have to go down to the Twat Cafe? <laughs> all right, I'm sorry. Back to the story. 6 a.m., my dad gets up and walks down to the kitchen to get his morning coffee. As he walks into the kitchen, he is welcomed by a random man sat at the kitchen table, staring at him. Being the cool, collected guy he is, instead of freaking out, my dad asks the guy if he wants a cup of coffee. Breakfast intruder agrees and joins him. A few minutes later, my dad's girlfriend comes in, also doesn't freak out and offers to make him some breakfast. So the three of them sit down have breakfast and have a chat for about 20 minutes or so. Apparently the conversation was a bit weird and nonsensical, but they didn't say what it was about. Breakfast finishes and they escort by through the front door. After he left, they started freaking out and naturally they called the police. The police came, took statements, etc. Later in the day, they're contacted by the police saying, that they apprehended the buy. Turns out the guy was a paranoid schizophrenic and was breaking into the odd-numbered houses on the street. My dad was the second house he'd entered. The first house, next door, he'd gone into, but it was empty. This was where he left his tools, a sawed-off shotgun, and a lot of ammo. His plan was to shoot anyone in the odd-numbered houses on the street. When the police arrested him, he told them that my dad and his girlfriend were the nicest couple he had ever met and that had stopped him carrying out his plan. When people say I'm too laid back for my own good, I tell them this story and it never fails to shut them up. This won't be as creepy as most of the stories here, but it's something that completely horrified me to my core when it happened. Back in my late teens in Dublin, Ireland, I used to head to a particular nightclub every single week and got to know most of the regulars there, to the point that I could sit at any table and know at least a few people. One night, I was introduced to a new woman that no one really knew that well, and I said hello, made very short and polite conversation, then went about my time as normal, dancing and drinking. Nothing much of note happened during my time in the club. At the end of the night, I left a little earlier than my friends because I lived really far away outside of the city. I ended up getting a taxi to get home which was very expensive, by the way, and got into bed, falling into a deep sleep. 
I woke up the next morning, sunshine streaming into the room, and immediately knew something was wrong. Too much weight on the bed. I spun and looked down to the very end of the room, and there, set on the end of the bed, was the woman from the night before, staring at me wide-eyed with utter devotion and a weird smile. It was totally fucking horrible. I had no idea what to say, so I said nothing. I was so weirded out by her expression and the whole bizarre nature of the situation. I was dumbstruck. It wasn't a lustful look. It was spooky, obsessive, and insane looking. I know for a lot of guys, the idea of having some random woman appear in their bedroom might be a thrill, but this was nothing like that. It was scary, plain and simple. I got up, got dressed, summoned up a bit of courage, turned to her and said, you're leaving right now and essentially marched her out of the house, telling her that buses leave from the end of the road every half hour. She left without saying anything. From talking to friends and family, I pieced together what had happened. After I left the nightclub, she had tried to catch me up, but instead had lost me. She went back, asked around until someone told her the area was pretty rough got a taxi there, knocked on random doors, waking up neighbors, and eventually one told her exactly where I lived, and then lied to my sister, saying that I had been expecting her. My sister was pissed off at me being woke up, but I let her in. From there, she got to my room and sat there for God knows how long, silently watching me. As it turns out, almost nobody from the club knew her at all, but we all assumed someone else must know her. What really spooks me is that if she had wanted to hurt me for whatever reason, she easily found her way right into my family house and right into my bedroom. Ugh, I'm just shuddering thinking about it. Hello everyone, this incident happened about five years ago. This is a story that I never really tell anymore because most people are either uncomfortable hearing it or make well-meaning comments about what I should have done in this situation without really understanding how differently your mind works when you're expecting absolute panic. But you guys seem to get it, so here's my story. I was living in a relatively nice neighborhood in downtown Memphis, working as an ophthalmic technician. I arrived home from work at my usual time, which was around 4.30 p.m., unlocked my door and went inside. I set my phone, wallet, and keys on the kitchen island, hearing my heavy metal front door swing shut loudly behind me and began taking care of some errands around the house. Having gone up to a small town, it was a habit for me to not lock my door during the day, especially when I knew my husband would be home soon anyway. I've never gotten to lock a pick once in my five years since this day. I walked through my bedroom and into my large walk-in closet and began hanging up the laundry that I started earlier in the day before work. My front door opened and I smiled with surprise. My husband was home a little early and I was happily calling out to him. I'm in here, love. I was met with silence and slowly began feeling that sinking feeling of something is wrong. It crawled up my spine. I tried to shake it off thinking my husband simply hadn't heard me and I walked out into my living room and kitchen area. Standing on the other side of my kitchen island was a complete stranger. He was male, older than me. I would estimate maybe 50s, but it's hard for me to recall exact facial features or details from this moment. No ski mask, no weapon, just watching me. 
I wondered if he'd maybe walked into the wrong apartment and was going to apologize and leave. But as he continued to stare, I realized I needed to do something other than just gape at the stranger in my house. I stood taller, puffed up my chest in an attempt to look more threatening, which is hard to do as a small female, and used a loud, clear voice telling him to get out of my apartment, that he had no business there in the first place. He completely ignored me, like I hadn't spoken. Then. He began to pick up things, my cell phone, my keys, my wallet. He picked them up methodically and put them in his own pockets. That's when it truly hit me that this person was dangerous. I was naive enough to believe this was all a mistake until that moment. I darted forward toward the only other device I had that would allow me to get help, my computer. I had to take a few steps closer to the intruder in order to reach it, but still had about 12 to 15 feet between us. So I knew I could grab it and run before he would ever reach me. As I picked it up and turned to run, I saw him start to move around me, and I sprinted back towards the bathroom because it was the only place I could go and put two locked doors between us, my bathroom door and the closet door. I slammed and locked the front door, and within seconds I could hear him messing with it, trying to open it. I ran into the closet and locked the door too, opening my computer and getting on Facebook Messenger to contact my husband. I sent message after message pleading with him to call 911 and tell him that there was an intruder in the apartment. He got the messages within minutes and assured me that he had a dispatcher on the phone and was leaving work himself to try and get to me if he could. I waited and waited. The bathroom door opened and the intruder came inside. He moved to the closet door and started running to break that door down. Here's the part where people usually start giving me advice on how I should have acted, but all I can tell you is that I was frozen with fear, with shock, I don't know. But I didn't scream or cry or search for a weapon in the dark closet. I didn't brace the door or try to, you know, hold it closed. I just knelt down in the closet and waited to die because I just knew that's what was gonna happen. People like to tell me that I lived in an apartment. Surely if I'd scream, someone would have heard it and come to help, right? Surely there was somebody heavy enough in my closet to use to defend myself. Hell, even the laptop I had would hurt if I swung it hard enough. Why didn't I do anything? I don't really have an answer for that. But the closet door miraculously held. I heard frustrated footsteps go back down into the living room area of my apartment. I heard things breaking, bottles shattering, my drawers in the refrigerator, and cabinets being flung open as things were torn out of them. I continued to sit in that closet, silently crying, wanting to leave, but feeling that death was inevitable. I feel awful about my selfishness in that moment, but I messaged my mom, who lived a good 15 hours away, and told her what was happening. I desperately wanted comfort and to tell her how much I loved her. I'm not a parent, but I can only imagine the fear and helplessness I put her through, knowing her daughter was in danger and there was nothing she could do to help. She messaged me constantly, begging me to keep replying. I told her I would as long as I could, but I also told her to tell my brothers I love them to help my husband through whatever happened next if it ended bad for me. The intruder started messing with the closet door again, mumbling disjointed words that I couldn't really distinguish. I remember hoping that the police would get to the apartment before my husband, that he wouldn't be the one to find me in whatever state this invader has left me in. The front door opened again, and it was my husband, shouting for me 
The intruder walked out towards the living room kitchen area again, where my front door was located. And I opened the door and darted from the closet to find my husband on the ground with him, pinning him into place. The man kept mumbling, at times yelling, but never really put up with much resistance. This entire part is a blur for me. I remember feeling like the room was spinning, filled with fear and mostly for my husband at this point. Eventually, the police found the apartment. It took them about 25 minutes to drive, which still blows in my mind. I know time seems to move slowly during scary situations, so I thought it was less than that. But from the time my husband called 911 to the time officers arrived, it was 25 excruciating minutes. This isn't intended to bash them in any way. It just always seemed like this was an unusually long response time for a home invasion. They got my things back from the man and took him out of the apartment. I numbly went through the process of filling out a police report, telling them exactly what happened. One of the officers commented that I should really keep my door locked at all times. I remember feeling like he was being insensitive at that time, or blaming me for what happened. But later I recognized his words were coming from experience. I'm sure he's seen the situation end differently for other women. In 30 minutes, the scariest incident of my life was over. But I've carried that fear, that violation, the anxiety of having someone intrude into my space for years. If it happened to me once, it could happen again. If you've made it this far, thank you for listening. Please consider continuing because this ain't all doom and gloom. If this or something similar has happened to you and you're still struggling with the aftermath of it, the sleepless nights, the laying awake listening to the sound of forced entry, the nightmares, the constant checking and rechecking our locks, this is what eventually helped me. A year after this took place, my husband and I moved to the Midwest for his job. We selected a safe town with a nice apartment complex and chose the third floor apartment with only one point of entry. I looked up every statistic on crime for that neighborhood, finding that an isolated incident of car theft was the only thing reported in decades. I still couldn't sleep at night. It was definitely better than staying in the same apartment in Memphis, but my husband often works night shifts and I simply couldn't continue being terrified to sleep at night. I realized my biggest fear wasn't that something could happen again, but that if it did, I was just as unprepared now as I was then. I hadn't changed anything other than locking my door and I knew I would likely freeze up again and leave my life up to being able to hide well enough, or having a door hold long enough to save me, and that was unacceptable. I walked into a martial arts school with an excellent self-defense program and started taking classes. At first I was quiet, hiding in the back of the room and generally keeping to myself. My instructor, who was both incredibly kind and incredibly insightful, slowly built up my confidence and brought me out of the bubble of fear. After several months of training, I finally shared my reason for taking classes with him, and he's worked with me tirelessly to give me the ability to protect myself in any environment. I've been training for years now, and the difference it has made in Every aspect of my life is unbelievable. The meek, quiet girl that wanted to die in her closet doesn't exist. I am confident. I am strong. I am worthy of living and protecting myself and my home. I no longer am ashamed of how I handled the situation I was in. But I also understand what steps I can take to ensure that I'm safe. It wasn't easy, and it didn't happen overnight, but it was worth it. 
I recognize this might not be a solution or option for everyone. Your experience is valid, and however you decide to cope with your own story is the right choice for you. This is how I happen to do it, and it's worked well for me. Thank you again for listening. I'm a little afraid of people hearing my story. I'm not quite sure how people will respond, but maybe doing so will help someone else's that's feeling alone in this. If anyone is struggling with your own story and with a kind ear to listen, I will be here for you. I've got a good one that incorporates the true monsters around us. A couple of years ago, my boyfriend and I went on an impromptu road trip. We packed up the car and the dogs and drove up to the far northern California Redwoods. I was somewhat familiar with the area from the time I was a kid, and it seemed very dangerous just heading out without a true destination in mind. A couple nights in, we ended up meeting up with a friend of a friend, grabbing some drinks, and she invited us to crash at her house for the night. We happily took her up on the offer because it saved us from dropping money on a hotel or trying to find a camping spot. She lived in a super cool looking old Victorian house. Her friends normally had six roommates, including several guys, but since it was summertime and most of them were students, it was only her and another female roommate, plus us, for the night. We drank some beers and hung out, and then we decided to crash. Both roommates were upstairs, and my boyfriend and I were with our dogs. And we were crashing on a futon downstairs in a room that was right in the front of the house, off the front door. It was kind of like a sitting room with a fireplace and big bay windows, looking out onto the front yard, which had a good cover of bushes. We both fell asleep easily and went into deep sleep until we were suddenly awakened by the doorbell ringing. Now, this is an old Victorian, so it has an old school deep ringing bell that you hear throughout the entire house. One of the residents of the house came down and opened the door and looked out and saw nothing. So she went back upstairs to bed. My boyfriend and I thought it was kind of weird, but you know, not our house. Maybe late night visitors were common. We fell back asleep and were then awakened again sometime later by the doorbell. We heard the roommate come down again and look outside the door and shut it. This time, she walked into our room after and asked if we heard the doorbell, and we could tell she was weirded out. We told her not to open the door if it happens again, and all came to the conclusion it might be the doorbell malfunctioning or something like that. The roommate goes back upstairs and we fall back asleep. Next I woke up was to one of my dogs growling the most deep-throated growl I have ever heard from him. He absolutely loves people, even if they are strangers, and we live in the downtown of a pretty major city, so Having him growl at something at night is not normal. We chalk it up to being in an unfamiliar house and tell him to be quiet. I fell back asleep. Next thing I know, I wake up to my boyfriend jumping out of the bed and literally smacking the bay window about five feet away from our bed and yelling. There's a man's face standing in the window, staring at us. My boyfriend immediately grabbed an axe, since we had been camping, it was right at hand, and chased the guy down the street. I'm sure whoever that creep was must have shit his pants. This whole commotion woke everyone up, and we stayed up for the rest of the night keeping guard. The scariest thing to me is that the guy was probably casing the house. If he wanted to rob it, there's no reason he would say hi to the ring doorbell multiple times. He wanted to see if it was only the girl's home, depending on who came out of the door. This still gives me the chills 
thinking about it today. I was 14 and my family had just moved to a big and kind of run-down farmhouse that was actually kind of creepy, but cheap to rent. The closest neighbors were pretty far away and a cornfield surrounded most of our property. One night at around 2 a.m., I woke up to the light in the hallway going on. I'm a really light sleeper, by the way. A few minutes later, my dog starts whining outside my door and scratching it to be let in. I get up and let him in and he crawls under my bed to sleep. He does this sometimes, but had never woken me up to be let in before. I was a little weirded out, but also pretty tired, so I fell back asleep without much thought. I wake up again a little while later to my bedroom door creaking. I see fingers wrapped around the side of the door as it's being slowly pushed open. I'm in a half-sleep kind of stupor. I ask who it is, and a man, clearly trying to imitate a woman, assures me that he is my mother. Just checking on you. I keep saying, no, no you're not. You don't sound anything like my mother. And he kept assuring me that he was. I obviously am not fully awake yet, or I would have noticed how creepy and weird this exchange was. Suddenly, the door starts being pushed open even further, and the hand pushing that door, followed by an arm, and I realize the person is coming into my bedroom. I started freaking out and screaming when I realize what is happening. My dog jumps out from under the bed and lunges at the door, causing the person to shut it quickly and not allowing me to see his face or anything at all. By this time, my mom has woken up from my screaming and starts yelling to me asking if I'm okay. She comes down the hall to my room and says that she saw a big figure with stockings on his head standing right outside my door. My mom started screaming then too, and the person ran down the back staircase of our house, which had a door and simply looked like a closet. So they had prior acknowledge of its existence, apparently, or they wanted to hide in a closet, and then ran out the back door into the cornfield. Nothing in my house was stolen, and there was no evidence that the person that had broken in wanted anything other than to come to my home or my room. I don't think I've been the same since this happened, and I still feel incredibly anxious even thinking about it. Let's not talk about sleep. Okay, to start this, I live in a very rural town in Australia. I have a close-knit group of friends, maybe four or five, and we hang out all the time. On this specific day, I was at my friend's house. About two days before this, her family came home and all the doors were wide open, yet nothing was taken. This family insisted on leaving one of the doors open, specifically in this town where crime runs rampant. On the day that I was over, let's call these two friends Alyssa and Mike. Of course, those aren't their real names. Me and Mike were over at Alyssa's, just hanging out on our phones when the front door banged open. We all looked at each other, but brushed it off as wind slamming the door. In hindsight, wind would not have been able to reach this door as it was in a little covering. I don't know how to explain it, but... You walk upstairs, there's a little room, and then there is a front door. Maybe two minutes later, the two sliding back doors slammed very loudly. We again brushed it off to not scare ourselves. We are kind of dumb, so sorry about that. But then we heard loud noises inside the house and footsteps running around the noisy wooden floor. This is where alarm bells start firing in my head. 
I was thinking about how someone had already been there and wondering if this was the same person or people. We jumped up and me and Alyssa held the bathroom door closed. Her room doesn't have a lock. Alyssa suggests that we call the police. I didn't think it was a good idea, but as I'm holding the door, someone starts running and slamming into her door. At this point, it was definitely time to call 911. They pick up, try to talk to Alyssa. A little difficult because she is bawling her eyes out. Eventually, the operator understood, and within less than two minutes, police were at our door. The police officers were kind and just asked about the situation before saying, we found the kid. I thought they meant the person that broke in, so I asked them about the kid. The police looked confused and said, uh, the missing five-year-old. We had no clue that there was even a mentioned child on the loose. The police officer said that there was about 40 cars looking for reasoning for the break-in, and it was crazy. They said it was probably a police officer running in and looking for the kid. We all looked confused, and then he realized what he had said and backtracked saying. Uh, they should have announced themselves, though. Pretty scary experience, with police officers trying to calm us down. But after talking with them and with my friends, whoever broke in probably knew Alyssa's mom, leaving the house with two teens in the back, so they thought the house was empty. Alyssa has a brother, so altogether they have three in the house. But on this day, her brother had a friend over, and they were driving somewhere. So please... Robber who broke into our house. I hope you're behind bars. For a little background, I'm a 27-year-old female, and I recently just moved into a nice apartment in a safe neighborhood with my two dogs, Charles and Wigwam. Charles is a Corgi German Shepherd mix and is the most loving but overly obnoxious dog while Wigwam is a Lhasa Apso who is quiet, sweet, and most definitely scared shitless of his own shadow. I've only been in my new place for about a month and after this experience, I highly doubt I'm going to make it here for the duration of my year-long lease. The way these apartments are set up is that each floor has its own set of doors that led to four apartments and a fire escape door that only opens from the inside. I'm on the very back side of the building, which places my patio about 10-ish feet from the fire escape stairs. I take my dogs out three times a day, midnight being the latest I will go out by myself. And every time, I just leave my apartment, put the bar lock back on my patio door, and locked my front door without fail. About a week ago, we had a snowstorm, and I cracked my patio door because, well, I love cold weather, and I'm a fucking adult, and if I want to watch the snow fall, then I can do as I please. Mistake number one, I let my guard down because I'm a stubborn twat. It was around 11 p.m., and I decided that since it was getting late, I should take the dogs out for the rest of the night. And since they both hate snow, this would be a quick trip. I go to lock the patio door and decide against it because I'm on the freaking fifth floor, and I'm only going to be outside for a few minutes. I get the dogs ready, grab my keys, and lock my door as I leave the apartment. I get down to the designated pet area with my beloved snow-hating dogs and let them do their thing and then back to the apartment we go and we get back in safely. Or so I thought. This is where I thought I was losing my mind, but in actuality, shit was about to get real. As soon as we walk into the apartment, my dogs run over to the patio door and I notice the door is shut and the bar is locked. Mistake number two, I immediately think 
that strange, but didn't connect the dots. I go into the kitchen to get dog treats, and both dogs start going batshit crazy and growling at a large cedar chest in my living room. And as I'm walking around to see what all the commotion is about, I see a pair of eyes creeping from under the chest lid. I stood there for about five seconds before I realized what I was actually seeing, and calmly walked backward to my front door opened it, and told my dogs, let's go outside. And they ran out without leashes, and I immediately get them, and myself, in my car, lock the doors and call the police. The police show up in less than five minutes, and they go up to my apartment, and after about 20 minutes, two officers are dragging a 40-ish year old fucktard out of my building in cuffs, and the plot thickens. This dude has been watching me since I moved in and had been staking out my place, waiting for an opportunity to get inside because he knew that I lived alone. If that's not creepy enough already, he had a fanny pack since it's still 1990. And, you know, he had a pocket knife, needles, ketamine, and a picture of me from the day I moved in and his plans were to sneak in through the patio door, wait for me to fall asleep, and God knows what else. Needless to say, I didn't sleep for days because I thought he would come back. Luckily, the bastard is still sitting in jail, but I'll never forget those eyes. So to the guy who planned on drugging me in my sleep, fuck you. I'm a girl, and this happened when I was 20 in the early 2000s. People used landlines, and cell phones were not unlimited. This happened in a town about an hour away from Sacramento. My friend was house-sitting for a family that her family was friends with from church. She was to house-sit in the country, just outside of town for a week. They had animals like cats, rabbits, a donkey, and a horse. The family also had dogs too, but the family took the dogs with them. My friend was in charge of feeding the animals and watching the place. She didn't have to get the mail daily because they had this metal lockbox style mailbox down their long driveway. They didn't have any neighbors for miles, just fields of cattle and corn. So I guess the lockbox was for safety. Towards the end of the week, she asked if I wanted to spend the night and keep her company. And I thought it sounded fun. I had moved out of my aunts and uncles and gotten my own apartment. So I told her I'd pick her up on the way there, after I got out of work. We get there at around 9.30 p.m., grabbing dinner on the way. We went into the barn first thing and fed the animals. It was late for their dinner and they made their hunger known with their animal noises. We made sure they had water, then we went inside. The house was this big ranch style house, single story. The living room was to the left as you walked into the home. There was a long hallway directly to the right of the entrance that led to where the bathroom and bedrooms were. Straight ahead, there was a dining area and to the left of that was the kitchen area and a patio door. They did not have an open floor plan. In the kitchen, on the opposite side from the dining area, was a long hall that had several doors. My friend explained that the wife ran a daycare center out of the house. These rooms were play areas for the kids she took care of. We didn't bother going over there because we had no interest. We watched some TV, ate our leftovers, and talked about people we knew. As it got later, she turned on the house alarm and said she didn't like sleeping in other people's beds. So she had been sleeping on the couch, then offered it to me. She would sleep on one of the two huge recliners that reclined so far back, it was almost flat. The chairs were really comfortable, so I just said I'll take the chair. I went and laid back in the chair with my blanket. 
we turned off the TV and we were talking for maybe 20 minutes in the dark. When the motion sensor floodlight started shining through the window, lighting up the room. Now, I really have no idea why people in the country think it's okay not to have curtains or blinds, because to me, that's insane. We both got quiet and Amanda says, maybe it is one of the cats. Then she started hearing gravel crunch, like a person walking across gravel in the parking area outside. My chair was closest to the window and I slid carefully down to the floor, clutching that stupid blanket the whole time. The floodlight timed out and my friend slid to the floor too. We laid on our stomachs in the dark, not knowing what to do for a minute. When we heard a loud bang and all of a sudden the house alarm starts blaring and the floodlight turn on again. It was so loud we had to cover our ears and I started to panic. I swear I have never been so close to pissing my pants in all of my life. I began crawling towards the keypad for the security because I've seen the commercials. There's a button you push and a person responds to you in case of an emergency or at least sends the police. The main screen says patio one of two open. Amanda starts to cry a little and hits the call assistance button on the pad. And nothing happens. There's no assistance. I ask her where the phone is and she says, there's a phone in the kitchen and one in my parents' bedroom down the hall. So our choices were to go to the kitchen, past the windows, and next to one of the patio doors, or to go down the hall to the parents' bedroom and just use the phone there. I asked her where the other patio is, and she said it was in the daycare part of the house. It was an easy decision. We go into the parents' room, and it's pitch black. I ask her where's the phone, and she says, I think we have to turn on the light. I really don't want to turn on a light, but have no choice. I don't have a flashlight and I didn't bring my cell because I had limited minutes. It was a simpler time and Amanda didn't even get on her own cell until after this happened. She turns on the light and we start looking around the room. Not only did these people not have curtains on any windows, but they didn't even have closet doors. We see a golf club leaning against the wall by the bed. They probably have it instead of a baseball bat, which is what I have next to my bed at home. We figured if we hit someone with it, it's gonna leave a mark. She grabs it and we continue our search for the phone. Looking at the obvious places, we'd find a cordless phone stand, minus the actual phone. The alarm is still raging. We have a light on and the person who opened the patio door is bound to notice all of this commotion. I'm thinking at this point. She asks, should we use the locate phone buttons? I look at her and respond, yeah, if you want some strange guy coming in here with it and asking us if we were looking for something. I'm getting mad that I'm scared. And in this situation, standing there knowing that we have to go to the kitchen, the house alarm stops. It gets very quiet. If you'd lived in the country, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There isn't another golf club for me to grab, so I made her go out first, flipping every light on and keeping the doors we passed in the hallway closed. We double checked the security panel and it still says patio open. I hit the call button and it still doesn't work. Double checking the front door is locked. We start for the kitchen. I tell her we have to check the patio near the kitchen, and I grab a big knife that wasn't even close to being sharp from the kitchen. We check the patio door near the kitchen, and it's locked. We turn on all the lights and grab the phone and dial 911. Phone isn't a cordless one. It's one of the old ones with a cord attached on a wall. My friend is on the phone with the dispatcher telling her what happened and I hear a whistle coming from outside 
the kitchen window. The thing people don't ever think about, because I didn't in my thinking that safety was turning on the light, is while you have the reflection of the inside of the window, people on the outside have a very clear view of you, unless you press your face against the window. I hear the whistle again. It sounds like somebody trying to get someone's attention, kind of whistle. But I don't see anyone outside, and I'm not pressing my face to the window to see if I'm the person he's whistling for. My friend is still talking to the dispatcher and is crying and saying she doesn't have the address to the house. She hands me the phone and I say, Hello? The dispatcher lady who sounds annoyed tells me she needs an address to send police to. I ask that she trace the call and she says something like, You're house sending and you don't even know where you're at. Scared, angry, and overwhelmed, I hand the phone back to Amanda and start looking for something with an address in the kitchen. I'm looking for it in the junk drawer, on the counter, on the refrigerator, fully keeping an eye down the hall that has the daycare rooms, knowing that on the other side of that door is a patio door that was open. Amanda tells the lady that she doesn't pick up the mail because of their lockbox and then a few seconds later removes the phone from her ear and stares at me with a blank face. I ask her if they're tracing the call because I cannot find anything with an address. Amanda tells me, she said I hope the police find you in time, and then she hung up the phone. I was now really scared and pissed off at the same time. We knew that there were people outside, we knew that the patio door to the daycare area was open. We did not know what to do. We stood in the kitchen, silent for what seemed like forever, but it was probably like a minute or so. I picked up the phone and dialed 411. I told Amanda that they would have the number to the police department. As calmly as I could, I explained what has happened to us to 411. I included the 911 dispatcher and said we really needed the phone number of the town's police department. When we heard a huge metal bang just outside the kitchen window by the back patio door, it sounded like someone dropped something metal and heavy. Amanda started crying and I couldn't hold in my fear anymore and started crying as well. The 411 operator said that they were connecting us and would stay on the line with us until after getting pissed at the 911 dispatcher on our behalf. A police officer answered the phone and the 411 operator started explaining what was happening to the police. They were asked to disconnect once we had an established connection. The police asked a few questions and we heard the whistle again outside and floodlights all around the house turned on again. I was too scared to even look outside, and we had never turned on the patio light because we had to walk past the two patio windows to get to the switch. We told the policeman on the phone about the whistle, and he said that there should be several policemen showing up shortly and to stay on the phone. We were just outside the town limits and knew it might take a few minutes. Having an officer on the phone made me feel a little better, but I was still really scared. He told us that the police arrived and were coming up the driveway. The policeman said to put down the phone and open the door, so I did. What I saw was a police pickup truck with spotlight flashing into the pastures that ran along both sides of the drive. Two officers, not with handguns, but with shotguns walking slowly beside the truck as it came up the long driveway. Four officers approached the house asking us our names. One went to the phone and said that they were here and hung up the phone. They ordered us to stay in the dining room and began searching the house and property. One by one they returned. The last one came back in through the patio door by the kitchen. He said he searched the barn and the horse scared him, and the horse also looked spooked. 
He asked what other animals were in the barn. They told us they didn't find anyone and that the daycare patio was not locked. There was, however, a broom handle in the track to prevent it from being open too far. I looked at the patio door that the officer entered in and saw that there was not a brown handle in that one. Then I felt dumb because he just walked through it. They lectured Amanda about not knowing the address of the house she was supposed to be responsible for and other stuff that I don't remember. After finishing statements, they said they'd stick around and look more. And if we wanted to leave, we could. They could lock the bottom lock, but not activate the alarm. And we were cool with that. We were out of there as fast as we could. We got into my car and went to her mother's. So mentally exhausted, we fell asleep, and I went to my office job the next morning. She said she really didn't want to go back to that house, but she had to feed the animals their breakfast. My mom told her to take her sister, and she did. That afternoon, she called me at work. She was really nervous and began telling me that when they went to the house, there was footprints and poop all along the carpet. I said it was probably the cop that checked the barn. She said that she didn't know or pay attention. Also, she said that when they went into the barn to feed and water the animals in the morning, someone had tied all the rabbit's legs together in their hutches. They had 10 rabbits, the kids used for 4-H. Amanda then continues to say, there was a note with the word, lucky scribbled on the back of a pizza carton she thought came from the refrigerator door because the flyer was missing a coupon. It took a while for them to untie the rabbits and Amanda asked her mom to find someone else for their church to finish the house setting. She wasn't going back. She also told the officer what she came back to, but no one was ever caught and the police never called either of us to update us. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I'm not holding my breath waiting on that phone call. I'm a security guard for an alarm response company. We enter alarms for businesses and private residences. 99% of the time, it's a motion detector set off by a cat or a restaurant forgot to disarm their stuff before the stock truck arrived to unload. In this case, I was called out to a house where the back door alarm was set off, like it thought someone opened it. The owner was out of town, but she was alerted by her app and had her mother meet me there. We checked the door. It's locked. We figured maybe someone tried the door, but it didn't budge, setting off the alarm. But there's a light on inside. The mom mentions this to her daughter on the phone. Daughter says she isn't sure if she left the light on or not. It's a good idea to make people think someone's home, but she just wasn't sure. That gave me a bad tingle. The mother waited to go inside to check. However, she didn't have a spare key. The neighbors did, but they were asleep and mom didn't want to wake them up. So I fill out my papers and go back to my normal patrol routes. An hour later, the same home sends an alert out. I'm the only one in my city zone, so I answer it again. When I pull up, police and CSI are there talking to one another and the now awake neighbor. They were reviewing video footage sent to them by the daughter. I look at the footage. Four armed men wearing black masks and hoodies came out of the bathroom a minute after the mother and I left. They proceeded to rob the place. They had broken in and locked the door behind them for appearances. They're the ones who turned on the light. My mother told me three guys had robbed her daughter's home a month ago. Somehow, they knew when this girl would be out of town. They appeared smart, desiring a quiet robbery without conflict. 
but they brought guns, so they were prepared to shoot their way out of trouble if need be. The mother had wanted to go in. If she'd had a key or woken the neighbor for the key, we would likely have been shot dead by these guys when we went inside. Work doesn't give me Kevlar vests or anything of the nature. If I ever get another house call and someone is there, I am not going inside no matter what it asks of me. I count myself fortunate the way was blocked this time because I was prepared to foolishly go in and check if I could. The 1% of the calls were something is actually off. It has never been as bad as this one. To the robbed armors, I hope you're behind bars. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true home invasion stories. I'd like to take a moment and thank the reform members of Back to Ashes. Tina Mead, Colt Stone Wolf, Mrs. Innerscare, Luz Crispin, Tammy Slayton, C.A.G., Denise Sess, Samantha Play, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Norma D.W., Christy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's niece. Thank each and every last one of you for supporting Back to Ashes. There's just not enough words to thank you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.